Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. And I must say, agreeing with the previous speaker, it's been an absolutely fascinating last two days. So my role here today is to draw and highlight some international uh, lessons and insights into uh, the design of laws, regulations and policing approaches as they may pertain to specific elements of the uh, Canadian uh, new framework. So there's no doubt that legalising uh, the recreational production, distribution and use of uh, cannabis in um, Canada opens up many new frontiers and many opportunities for improved public health and public safety outcomes through better quality control, reducing black markets and the like. But there are, as has been spoken of, many different policy dilemmas and choices that must be made. And I think one of these gets down to the sheer complexity, the number of things that have to be considered, whether that's in relation to uh, mechanisms for production or supply, or specific elements, two of which I'm going to focus a little bit on today, being the threshold limits uh, for the amount of personal possession and drug driving laws. But I think the good news is that there are actually many lessons that can be drawn from international experiences to um, shape and inform this process, both now but also going forward. Because I'm keeping in mind that this is, as we heard yesterday, a process. And so um, being aware of what to look out for, what are the sorts of things you might want to be looking for, researching um, and potentially adapting down the future is as important as getting things right at the get-go. So, my key questions for today is firstly, what do cannabis users in general, but also particularly in cannabis, want from a legal market? And how does this um, current framework, um, or how does the current framework take into account their particular wants and uh, concerns? And I think this question is important because if you end up with a framework that isn't fitting with what cannabis users want, then there may be more demand for the black market. Conversely, cannabis users might actually be highlighting some things that they want that hasn't been thought of to date. My second question is how do the new Canadian uh, roadside drug testing laws compare against some of the uh, other international best practices and are there some other measures that might be worth considering or including to improve public health and safety outcomes in relation to drug driving? Thirdly, in relation to the threshold limits uh, for personal possession that have been uh, proposed at the federal level, um, how can we assess if these are fit for purpose? And might there be any risks if uh, you end up with thresholds that aren't fit for purpose? And finally, with relation to policing, what might this look like? And will the, um, the promise of uh, reducing on the burden of the criminal justice system be um, re realistic? Before I get into this, I wanted to very briefly touch on some lessons from Australia because I've had a number of people uh, ask me about this um, over the last two days. So, Australia was actually one of the first countries in the world to introduce a form of um, drug law reform through a de jure cannabis decriminalisation. This occurred back in 1987 uh, in South Australia. And this allowed adults at the time to possess a small amount of cannabis for their own personal use and if caught, pay a, like a parking fine. Um, a similar provision was provided for personal cultivation of up to three plants. Now, at the time, there were a lot of concerns that this would lead to a mass increase in cannabis use, but this was not realised. Instead, uh, we've seen this reform um, copied to two other jurisdictions or expanded, and since that time, we've had an even larger expansion in what we call as a de facto drug law reform, whereby police um, um, and law enforcement agencies across every single state and territory have provided pro programs for the diversion of people detected for, with small amounts of drugs um, out of the criminal justice system. So instead of charging, people will be referred, either get a warning um, or referred to the treatment system or with the option of treatment. So you can see kind of some of the um, programs there. I think the important thing is that this has not only been just for cannabis, it's been for um, other illicit drugs, including methamphetamine, heroin and uh, cocaine. So what have we learnt from this? Well, there have been some teething problems, and I think this is an important lesson we've heard, again, in the last few days. Keeping in mind there do need to be adjustments with any new reform, 
But the federal system in our case, and I think probably in yours, also provides a lot of opportunity to learn and identify pretty quickly what's working, what's working not so well. And in terms of impacts, has this had benefits? Well, yes. It's reduced drug use, it's reduced the rates of criminal offending, it's led to better social outcomes and uh, significant reductions in the criminalisation of people who, are, um, people who use drugs. I think probably the most um, stark you know, statistic and um, indicator of this is that less than 1% of those people who are detected for use and possession in Australia end up imprisoned for that offence alone. So, uh, turning to what uh, Canadian and more uh, globally, globally cannabis users want from a legal regulated market, um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this from the Global Drug Survey, uh, including Professor Adam Winster. So, the data for this is drawn from the Global Drug Survey, which is the world's largest uh, um, survey of alcohol and drugs that's run annually and it's been going now for over six years. Um, this is a self-report survey, but it's, it's managed to accrue large numbers of people, often over 100,000 people. Um, and in 2017, there was a specialist module added um, about cannabis regulation that sought people's views on what would they like from a cannabis uh, regulated market. Um, views about pricing and uh, restrictions, as well as concerns. So, what did we find? Well, the first thing um, that was asked was how would people um, who use cannabis like to see recreational cannabis use being regulated? Perhaps unsurprisingly, most people would like it to be legal. Um, but um, most people would also like it to be available through shop fronts. But perhaps something that was less unexpected is most people would like it to be available through shop fronts without advertising. And this is contrary to the US model. When we look at views across different countries, including the United States and Canada, we can see, again, a similar view. There is a preference for legal sales through outlets without um, advertising. Turning to the types of restrictions that Canadian cannabis users would like to see um, implemented about the sales, we can see there's a number of different things that have been raised, but I'll just highlight three. The first is there's a clear um, preference for age restrictions. So um, close to 70% have said that sales should be restricted to people aged 18 and over, um, and an additional 28% uh, said um, it should be restricted to those aged 21 and over. Another thing there is a strong preference for is labelling, um, uh, clear labelling about THC content, about uh, CBD content and about the potential harms from use. And uh, the third thing of note is, again, consistent with the views before, there is a preference either for no advertising at all or no advertising to youth. One other thing that was asked was, would you like guidelines about cannabis, uh, uh, safe cannabis uh, use? And overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. The 76% uh, would like cannabis regulation guidelines. And I think this is an important message for governments. Um, and finally, in relation to the concerns, the number one concern that cannabis consumers had um, about a legal regulated market is if um, the new regime ended up being um, um, promoted and run the same way as the alcohol or the tobacco industry. The second biggest concern uh, is a rise in use amongst youth. Um, thirdly, an increase in tobacco uh, use. And finally, increase in drug driving, something I'll touch on in a moment. So I think what this shows is that contrary to what we might um, kind of popularly cons consider, there is actually a strong preference for a public health um, framework around, uh, around cannabis, which I think is very good news in terms of the Canadian model, particularly when you consider um, their preferences and desires for age restrictions and clear labelling of products. <coughs> 
Um, I'm less sure about to what extent their preferences align with the desires about no advertising, particularly in relation to adults, um, but uh, it's very clear in relation to youth that that's where there's been more discussion. And there, is, there are clear calls for guidelines, which I think um, is something that could be potentially taken up. Um, and finally, I think just keeping in mind the core concerns is important, particularly in relation to the growth of big uh, cannabis. Turning to drug driving laws. Um, the Canadian federal government has um, recently piloted roadside drug testing, and they've proposed um, a series of laws in relation to this. The question is, how does this compare against kind of international best practice? And I'm comparing this against Victoria in Australia because this was actually the first place in the world to introduce uh, roadside <laughs> drug testing laws. So when we compare the, uh, the, the approaches, we can see that both have this kind of staggered penalty approach with harsher penalties for more severe um, offences, which is good. But then the Victorian approach has a number of other provisions that we can't see in the Canadian approach, particularly stricter penalties for alcohol and drugs um, combined as opposed to just drugs. This is something that we know from a public health perspective is really important because it's more harmful. Um, Victoria also has automatic licence disqualification and it has the option of using education instead of sanction for those who are detected through these. So I think these are some measures that could be worth considering to uh, add to the Canadian uh, laws and approaches. Turning now to the threshold limits in relation to cannabis. The current Canadian federal guidelines are that people who will be able to possess up to 30 grams and they've mandated that provinces can either keep that or reduce the limits. The question is, are these fit for purpose? I think this is really important to consider because uh, anyone who exceeds these, as we heard from um, a police spokesperson before, may be subject to penalties of a fine or up to five years prison. We've got some, um, in the Australian context, threshold limits have been widely used. And back in 2010, we were um, asked by government to um, provide advice about whether threshold lines, or threshold um, limits were fit for purpose. So how did we do this? Well, we gathered together a wide range of data uh, that existed on the patterns of consumption and the patterns of drug purchasing. We then took into account practices of um, both regular consumers as well as occasional consumers. We looked at patterns under typical situations as well as atypical situations. We also looked at um, patterns across different states and territories. What uh, this showed was that the threshold limits were often not fit for purpose. So people possessed amounts uh, either for their personal use or bought amounts that exceeded the existing threshold limits. Uh, the consequences of that was that it led to um, many unjust sanctions as well as increased the burden on the criminal justice system. When we turn to look at the Canadian estimates, um, unfortunately, traditionally, the Canadian drug surveys haven't looked at uh, the quantities um, being consumed or purchased. There has been a new Health Canada survey that, uh, that included some questions about this, and this found that most people purchase 11.5 grams um, with up to 14 grams. But unfortunately, there hasn't been any insight, at least as far as I can see, into the practices of people who are regular users or people who are dependent, or particular cohorts who may uh, use uh, larger quantities, particularly marginalised populations, um, and nor is there any uh, analysis of whether patterns may actually differ across provinces. And if, um, at least from the Australian experience, we see that as a, um, a, a clear limitation. So I think legislators should be uh, aware that the threshold limits may not be fit for purpose and try to gather data um, or at least be aware and assess this as it's rolled out um, into the future. And particularly, they should avoid lowering the threshold limits as they apply.
Finally, in relation to policing. Given a clear goal of, of the new regime is to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system, a key question is what role should police play? We've just completed the first cross-national analysis um, that's um, compared the incidence of police encounters amongst people who use drugs across 26 different countries. Um, again, we used a specialist module in the Global Drug Survey for this. And we showed there were large differences in the incidence of police encounters, um, even amongst countries that had decriminalised uh, drug use and possession. So this graphic uh, illustrates this. So I've highlighted here just uh, three countries, the Netherlands, Portugal, and then Italy. So what you can see is of our 26 countries, Italy actually had um, by far the largest rate of um, people being stopped by police in spite of um, having a decriminalised approach. And I think this is in line with what we heard before from the police um, spokesperson, that decriminalisation can reduce the burden on the criminal justice system, but not, um, it won't necessarily translate in all cases. Finally, when we look at what's happened um, in relation to policing uh, under legalised uh, frameworks, um, the time we, when we conducted the survey, there were four states in the US that had legalised uh, uh, cannabis. So we were able to see how did those particular states compare to other um, parts of um, America. So we can see that overall, uh, the, the, overall the states that had legalised cannabis showed significantly less, um, well, lesser rates of uh, police um, encounters. Um, particularly, you can see that in Alaska, Washington and Oregon. Or Oregon. Um, but Colorado still had a high rate of police encounters. Um, reasons for this, I'm not clear of, but I think it's in line with what we've seen in relation to decriminalisation that suggests the legalisation or the regulation has the capacity to reduce um, policing, but policing may remain um, higher under some models. And I think in light of what we heard yesterday about the potential for racial bias, this is a particular issue that does need attention to, as well as the issue we heard earlier about how youth um, may still um, be policed and may even be more policed than they are under the current regime. So to conclude, I think this shows that uh, the Canadian framework is broadly in line with what uh, Canadian cannabis consumers would like to see. So I think that's great news. Um, but I think there's also the potential for legislators to take into account some of their concerns, particularly about advertising, and perhaps to introduce some of the things like the guidelines for safe uh, cannabis consumption. Um, I think it's important for legislators and policymakers to consider the current and future fit of the threshold limits around personal possession, as well as to potentially continue, uh, potentially extend the roadside drug testing laws by adding some other elements that may um, ultimately improve the capacity for uh, public health um, and public safety. Um, and finally, in relation to policing, um, you know, legalisation clearly has the capacity to reduce the demand on prisons as well as policing. Uh, but I think it is really important to have, the, you know, have very clear um, discussions and uh, views going in about what, is, what role should police be playing, um, in what context should they be used, um, and uh, so that you don't end up with an increased burden on the criminal justice system. So thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors and I've got a list of references. So happy to send that through to anyone who might be interested. Thank you. Thank you.